Kelly? Yes. Um, he's from Texas. He's a member of the House of Representatives. He serves in the Democratic leadership as Chief Deputy Whip and Chair of the Congressional <coughs> Black Caucus and is co-chair of the Out of Poverty Caucus. The Congressman champions uh, affordable health care, education, investments in rural communities, veterans, renewable energies, and federal programs that support low-income and middle-class Americans. He is working to expand opportunities to all Americans and ensure the poor and middle class have a seat at the decision-making table, which is highly relevant to what we're discussing today. So please. Pleasure. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, let me thank you, Diana, for those kind words of introduction. I have only one technical correction uh, to the introduction. I hail from the state of North Carolina. Uh, I have visited Texas a few times in my life. I had a daughter who lived in Dallas, but I am indeed a, a uh, representative from North Carolina. I've uh, been in North Carolina all of my life, but it's good to see all of you. Don't worry about it. Uh, it happens to be at least once a day. Don't worry about it, seriously. And you can call my colleagues by the wrong name sometimes. Uh, but uh, I'm delighted to, to see you today. And let me begin by uh, bringing greetings to you on behalf of the Congressional Black Caucus, where I have served as the chair now for the past 11 months. It's a two-year term, so I have about 13 months remaining. Uh, but I bring greetings to you on behalf of our caucus. We just finished meeting uh, just a few moments ago. We have 46 members in the CBC. We started with 13 uh, back in 1971, and now the caucus has grown to a body of uh, 46 members. And one of our 46 members is in the United States Senate, Senator Cory Booker. And the other 45 serve here in the House of Representatives. And of the 45, one is a Republican, our dear friend Mia Love from Utah, and the other 44 are Democrats. <laughs> well, of the 44 Democrats, two are non-voting Democrats. Eleanor Holmes Norton from D.C. and Stacey Plaskett from Virgin Islands. And so we have uh, 42 voting Democrats and one voting Republican. So that's a total of 43 among our number who uh, have the ability uh, to cast votes in the House. And so I bring greetings to you on behalf of our caucus. Uh, we hail from 23 states. Uh, plus D.C. and the Virgin Islands, uh, collectively representing more than 30 million people in this country. So we're not just a social club, even though we have a little fun every now and then. Uh, the fact of the matter is we, we're about serious business. And if you had been at our meeting a few moments ago, uh, you would have, s have seen just how serious uh, our business can be. We, we're about the most serious things that you can imagine. And one of those subjects is the whole question of poverty. Uh, I represent what used to be the fourth poorest district in the country. Uh, recently, I picked up Durham, North Carolina, which is an urban area. And so I'm still in the bottom 10. Don't know, quite know where I rank, but I'm in the bottom 10, probably seven or eight uh, poorest district in, in the country. Uh, and that is uh, a challenge that we have. It didn't just happen when the recession came along. It's been pervasive poverty uh, now for, for many years. You may or may not be familiar with the term persistent poverty counties, uh, but the Census Bureau defines a persistent poverty county, a county that has experienced poverty in excess of 20% over the past 30 years. And therefore, it's called a persistent poverty county. That is a legal classification that the Census Bureau gives out, and, and uh, we have 394, I believe it is, persistent poverty counties in the United States of America, and that is absolutely unacceptable. And so I want to thank you for, for you, you coming today. I want to thank the coalition. I want to thank the panelists and all of the guests for letting me say uh, just a few words this afternoon. Uh, Fifty years ago, when I was graduating from high school, 1965, uh, President Lincoln, President Lincoln, <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you why Lincoln is on my mind. I've just been writing a speech this morning. This is the 150th anniversary of the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, uh, which was the Lincoln era. So I've been writing it all day long. But in 1965, uh, President Lyndon Baines Johnson declared an unequivocal war on poverty. Uh, we know Johnson for the Civil Rights Bill and the Voting Rights Bill, and all of that is certainly important. Uh, but he also declared a war on poverty. Uh, he demanded that members of Congress, the policymakers, address the inequalities that separated rich and poor. 
Uh, that included Medicare, Medicaid, Head Start, and all of the other great society programs that were introduced and, and brought through by President Johnson in, in 1965. Uh, much has changed for the better over the past 50 years, but more remains to be done as we work to end poverty in America and bring economic equality to all of our citizens. The statistics are very troubling. Uh, last year, nationally, 46.7 million people, sometimes we round it off and say 50 million, because sometimes people get left out of, of these surveys, but 46 million people live in poverty. Can you imagine? In a country that only has 300 million people, 50 million of those 300 million people live in poverty. What's that? One out of six. Uh, that is absolutely unacceptable for the most powerful and the most a robust economy on the planet. Uh, the poverty rate for the United States in 2014 was right at 15%, a number that continues to rise from year to year. The persistence of poverty in the African American community and the rapid widening of the racial wealth gap is even more distressing. Median income for African American households is $34,600, $24,000 less and the median income of white households, which is $58,000. The median net worth of white households, that's net worth now, net worth of white households is 13 times the level for African American households. Black Americans are three times more likely to live in poverty than our white brothers and sisters. At 10%, the well, actually, it's 10.1%. The current unemployment rate for black Americans is double. It's twice the rate for white Americans. And this is not a recent phenomenon. It has been going on for generations. We must do more to not only lift Americans out of poverty, but to prevent them from becoming impoverished in the first place. We have all of the tools in our toolbox. We have all of the ideas that we need to ensure that every person in this country has a shot at the American dream, but we'll have to work together to make it happen. Social safety net programs are under constant threat by Republicans based on the flawed logic that these programs create a culture of dependency among our nation's most vulnerable communities. That simply is not true. You may recall when we reached the debt limit a few years ago, I guess it was 2011, uh, the President could not borrow any more money. Uh, because we had reached the limit and we had a crisis, because we still had obligations to meet and did not have the money with which to, to meet those obligations. And so the President asked permission of the Congress to raise the debt limit by $2 trillion. And Speaker Boehner at the time and Leader Pelosi at the time uh, conferred and decided that, uh, that it was warranted. They had to reach, they had to raise the debt limit in order to meet the country's obligations. But when the Republican speaker took the message back to his caucus that we were going to raise the debt limit by $2 trillion. That was an absolute rebellion uh, among our Republican colleagues. And so it became very difficult. It became an impasse. And so finally, at the last minute, they reached an agreement that the president would be given permission to raise the debt limit by $2 trillion. But the trade-off was that spending had to be reduced by $2 trillion. And so part A of the agreement was that $1 trillion in discretionary spending, non-defense discretionary spending, had to be agreed to immediately. That's a trillion dollars over 10 years from the social safety net domestic programs we have in this country. That was the agreement, and it has been honored. Part B of the agreement was that uh, $1.3 trillion additional dollars would be cut uh, from the budget over the next 10 years and that half of that would come from the defense account and half from the non-defense account. And so to sum it all up without boring you with the details, don't let anyone tell you that we have not reduced the deficit uh, during the Obama years. The fact of the matter is, on day one of the Obama administration, he inherited a $1.4 trillion deficit. Today the deficit is $450 billion. It has been reduced significantly, but it has been reduced unfortunately, on the backs of poor people. The social safety net has been done on the backs of people who can least afford it, and that is, that is so unfortunate. And so we have an obligation to make sure that there's no further erosion in the social safety net 
and make sure that we continue to advocate for those who cannot advocate for themselves. And so that's, that's your challenge. That's what I'm charging you to do, uh, to go back to your communities and to fight as hard as you can to make sure that the public understands that it is, it is irresponsible, it is, it, is, it is everything that you can imagine, uh, unfair, uh, irresponsible, it's, it's unethical, it's, 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 it's against every value that we have as Americans to reduce the deficit on the backs of those who can least afford it. And so your passion and your compassion is very much appreciated. We've got a lot of work to do. We're in the middle of an election season. Uh, you've got to make sure that the candidates talk about this issue in every election across the country. I'm your friend. I'm your ally. We're in this together. Let's make it happen. Thank you so very much.